Okay, good. Sorry. Okay, so this is what happened. I have a blue mic that I tried to connect and didn't work. Not sure why the light is on, um, but whatever. Anyhow, I've had some technical difficulties, uh, but we're moving on. So today is Thursday, December 16th. Today was day 11 of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial, and it was the first day that the defense had to uh, present its witnesses, so it went really well for the prosecution. Um, before I say anything else, I just want to tell you guys, you know, I just want to thank you for, um, for your support during this time. Um, I understand that not everyone can uh, help me out now, and I totally get that. Um, I believe that the free market is the best way to, um, give me a second, oh, where is now? I'll get on sound now, okay. Um, so anyhow, I believe that the free market is the best way to know what works and what doesn't. And what I have come to realize is that my trial coverage is not something that my viewers really want. How do I know that? Okay, firstly, oh, firstly, um, I just want you guys to know because I think there's a lot of miscommunication about what's going on with these videos, okay? These videos are not being monetized. Why? Because it's about the trial. So the only way that I can, I get no ad revenue from this work. So the only way that I can get any type of support for, um, for these videos is through Super Chats, like now, or uh, just memberships. Memberships are $4.99 a month. I thought it was a good idea. I thought you guys would be like, hey, five bucks, awesome. But that didn't turn out to be the case. Um, and I get that. You guys, like, I understand. Everybody, this is the holidays and people are strapped. I get it. I do get it. But please try to understand me. Like, I can't continue this. It's a lot of work. And I'm getting no ad revenue. I'm not getting support. I have no sponsorship. Uh, I'm not getting support. Somebody mentioned, um, well, you should put up um, the super thanks button on your videos and that way people can donate, you know, whatever they want, whenever they want. And that would be a great idea, except that YouTube has not allowed me access to the super thanks button. So I think there's a lot of um, misconceptions about YouTube and how it actually works. Uh, but again, I will tell you that Definitely these videos are not monetized and definitely I'm not getting ad revenue from them and definitely I'm not getting the support that I thought I would get so I'm not going to be doing these anymore um, I went today because I was really curious and also because I hadn't spoken to you guys yet I hadn't said anything to you guys and I didn't want to just cut out of nowhere because I, I think that's rude um, and we had Monday Tuesday and Wednesday off and that's when I like kind of did the math and I realized they don't want it and that's fine. I'm not upset. Like I volunteered to go out there and do this because it's in my backyard. Well, it's in my city. So I figured, you know what, I'll go down there. I'll volunteer. I'll bring back the news. And, and I tried, I gave it a go, you know, for two, this would be well day 11 today. So for 11 days, I went down there and I tried it out and the market is just not there. So, um, I'm sorry guys, really I am. I just can't, I can't keep on doing it. But I was there today. And today was an extremely amazing day for the prosecution and I'm very happy to say that. So, again, it was the first day of the defense and they got to present. So how it works is this. So the prosecution went first and then they present their witnesses and then Defense cross-examines them, obviously. Okay, boom. The uh, prosecution rested on Friday. So we had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday off, and today we resumed, and it's going to be today and tomorrow. Next week, the trial will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off. The following week will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off for the new year, and then it will resume as usual Monday through Friday. Um, but like I said, I won't be around for that. Or even if I am, like I won't, I won't be covering it. Um, so what happened? So 
today, so now what's going to happen is that the defense has all of its witnesses up. Now, try to like understand the defense is very bad at their job. I understand that they don't really have a defense and that's understandable, of course, but my God, like the way that they question. And then they said that they were going to bring up 35 witnesses. When I heard that, like me and somebody, another friend of mine that's in there, she was like, no, that we're not, no, this is like not going to be able to, to happen because of the way that they present. It's horrific. Today, the prosecution, when they cross-examined, it was literally two questions. Boom, boom, get to the heart of it, shut it down. The one time that Pomerantz took her time with the cross exam still was nowhere near the amount of time that the defense usually takes because the defense's uh, strategy is to time it out, to time out the sessions, like take as long as it like possible, four or five hours. The prosecution does not work that way. The prosecution gets right to it, thank God. So it was a smooth day just because of cross exam. If anybody even bothered, it was straight to the point. And so let me just tell you how this all started off. So today, hold on, let me get my notes together. Mm, okay. Okay, so today, first witness, right? Okay, day 11. I'm just going to read from my notes like I usually do. So the judge, straight off the bat, let me just say, the defense wanted to present three anonymous witnesses. And so they're making their argument to the judge. And she's like, this is extraordinary. This is an extraordinary request. Like, why are you, are these people minors? And uh, the defense was like, no, they're not. Okay, are these people victims? And the defense is like, no, they're not. And the judge is like, okay, like, it's like going back to law school. So the judge is like, this is an extraordinary request. This is not something like, you don't get anonymity for your witnesses, if unless they're minors uh, or unless they're, they're victims. So that's a no, we're not gonna do that. So fine. This judge has been great. Let me just tell you guys, she's really been great. So, um, so then the the defense says they want to present evidence, but not for they want to present evidence for the record, but not on the record. Again, the judge, the judge just looked like, like uh, she was just like speechless. Like we all were. We were like, is this really how we're gonna start the day? Fine. So, um. The prosecutors today were Pomerantz, who was on fire, Mo, and Warbeck, the guy. The defense were Paliuka, Sternheim, she's good, and Everdale, super annoying. Uh, so we started off at 9.55, the jury enters. Um, first witness is Kimberly Espinoza. So she walks in. I'm thinking she's like a 40-something-year-old woman. She's Hispanic. She has long brown hair. She's dressed all in black, but with like a low-cut shirt. Like, who does that? In this case specifically, like, why would you even wear a low-cut shirt like this to a sexual, uh, like a sex ring trial, right? Well, that said it all. So she comes in and she's all very like, you know, whatever. And she sits down and then they ask her, okay, so what do you, who are you? What do you do? She's actually 55, which she looks amazing. Uh, she said, I'm an executive assistant to a CEO of a global company. That's all she said. She said she's been doing that for 10 years. Um, so they asked her about October 1996. She said she was 28 years old. She was living in Midtown, New York City. She didn't say New York City, but I assume because what else is called Midtown? And then they had to pause for technical issues. And then she said, I'm basically the gatekeeper for the CEO. Now, okay, so, so then she changed her tune. She said that she lived on the Upper East Side not midtown that she had forgotten whatever fine so she said she was hired as a legal assistant back in the day for the j epstein company for their legal counsel so defense says how'd you get the job she said one of the daily papers and then they go all into that like how she applied for the job who cares anyhow so she interviewed with two people at first jeff chance i think and darren it sounded like endite but my, that may not be Right, but it sounded like ending. Uh, the second round of interviews were with Ghislaine Maxwell, of course. And um, she said it was a very unique interview because Ghislaine just couldn't stop her busy day. The way, okay, you'll see anyway, but just the way they kept trying to like pound us with, oh, Ghislaine's so busy, so busy. Like the defense is just trying to mount this, this argument that she's too busy to have sex with minors. Okay, well, 
So this woman says, you know, the, the interview was very unique. We did it in the back of a limousine as Ghislaine, you know, rode around town um, doing all her errands because she's so busy. So it was so unique and, you know, it's memorable and whatever. And then um, it was just like very cringe because... I don't know, like the whole tone, like first of all, her shirt, straight off the bat, that that totally made me think certain things about her, especially because of this case, like the um, subject of this case. And then like, she's all smiles and she's all like doing like this with her hair. And I'm like, this is, person is not serious, right? And then you're gonna go around and you're telling us like, oh, you know, and we were around in a limousine and like, that is so cringe. Like, who does that? Like, why are you even, like, this is not Instagram. This is a court of law. Like, this is supposed to be a serious case. You're supposed to take this seriously. But she clearly was not a serious person. So she said that she met with Epstein for the final job interview, and it was a, quote, normal interview. What that means is, it's up to anybody to guess, because considering all the stuff that we know about Epstein, who knows, right? So... Then the defense asked her, well, did your job uh, position change? She said it did. Um, I, um, Ghislaine's assistant called out one day and I filled in. And Ghislaine decided that she wanted to keep me as her executive assistant. And that happened after just a month of being in the office. So do the math, guys. I mean, we're all adults here, right? Anyhow, she said that she worked there for six years from approximately November 96 to the end of summer in 02. Then she says, these are direct quotes, I spent a lot of time with her. She lived at 457, oh, 457 Madison Avenue was, Madison Avenue was the address of the New York City office. So uh, another quote, I highly respected Ghislaine. I looked up to her very much. At this point, I'm like, okay, I see what happened here. I don't want to get into this. Like, this, as far as I'm concerned, like, the reason why the defense would bring this lady in is just to say, like, oh, see, Glenn's a wonderful person, and that's fine if that's the, the point that you want to make, or to say, like, oh, I've never seen anything weird happen in the office. You can do that, too. Uh, what The other thing that she said is that she actually had, had seen Jane. Um, and if that's the point, okay. But at least tell your witness, like, keep it like keep your personal feelings out like it just made me feel and I have no proof for any of this it made me feel like her and Ghislaine had been lovers maybe and she was just like not over it and it was just a very awkward feeling I can't prove that I'm not saying that that's what happened I'm not alleging that that's what happened I'm saying that's how I felt okay so it's putting it out there so she said um it was a lot of work was a lot, a lot of high volume work that um, every task had to be done ASAP as soon as possible, if not yesterday. Uh, that Ghislaine was a very demanding boss, but that because of Ghislaine is the reason why she is the person that she is today. It's the reason why she got the job that she has today because uh, Ghislaine really prepared her for all of this and like high level and, and Ghislaine is so on everything and it's such a huge job and to do all this stuff and they really kept like reiterating that. Um, so she said she kept in touch with her after, yeah, no kidding, for a milestone like a milestone contacts, that's what they call it. So apparently like holidays, birthdays, et cetera, letters of recommendation, stuff like that. She identified Ghislaine Maxwell. So the defense said, do you see Ghislaine Maxwell here? She says, yes, I do, like this. And again, it's like, mm, this is the wrong tone. And then the defense says, okay, can you please describe her and point your finger at her? And she said, that's her over there, right over there with the purple hued sweater on, turtleneck on. And then she points at her. I, I don't understand why this woman can't keep it in her pants, right? Because this is a serious case. And if you really want, unless, unless she was trying to like double cross Galeen and just give everybody like a bad tone about her because I, we were creeped out. So anyhow, um, so she says, uh, blah, blah, blah. She worked a handful of times out of Galeen's place, her, her residence. Um, so then she rattles off a list of all the employees at the office. I don't know why we were all falling asleep. This is again, the defense's tactic to just like, like 
take all the time in the world so that the prosecution or so that the trial will take forever. I don't know. So then um, they even asked her to describe the layout of the office. Why does this matter? Why are we watching this? It, it's like stupid. There's no reason for this. So again, we, we're just like, whatever. So the judge is just like going like this, like just going like this and like this. And I'm like, exactly, like stop this. Like, I don't know if she could because they didn't really do anything wrong, I guess. But I would have asked like, where's this going? But she didn't. She was just super patient. So then she rattled off her legal assistant responsibilities, more snooze. Uh, she rattled off her uh, responsibilities as Ghislaine's assistant. Mm -hmm. And then the question was, where did Ghislaine Maxwell fall in the hierarchy? Um, after her relationship with Epstein had ended. So basically the defense, I think, was trying to make the point that after their romantic relationship ended, they weren't really that close anymore and whatever. Well, the lady responds, and this is a quote, well, she was very important to me. Nobody asked you that. Nobody asked you if she was very important to you. Right? So she's like, well, I don't know if she was, I don't know how important she was to um, Jeffrey, but she was very important to me. And it's like, again, like, why are you letting us see this part of your personal, like, whatever happened between you two? Like, this is not the time nor the place, nor do we want to know. We don't want to know. We just want to get through this defense, uh, or, um, like, uh, whatever they're, they're doing, and, and just get on with it. And this woman, I'm telling you, was super cringe. So then they asked her about the island. And she starts laughing and she starts giggling. And she says, the islands, the name was changed, the island's name, the, the name was changed to, it was Little St. James, um, James, but the name was changed to Little St. Jeff's. And then she like paused and went like this and like had this humongous smile on her face. And I was just like, this is so weird. Like, what is wrong with this woman? Is she on something? Like, I don't know, whatever. It's like she had such great memories of that place. I don't know. I'm just telling you how it looked. Um, so she said that she worked with Ghislaine Maxwell to get the island to what he wanted it to be. And then she giggled again, which that was, again, like super uncalled for because we all know what happened there or allegedly happened there. And where there's smoke, there's fire. So I, whatever. So just her giggling like that about what he wanted it to be, like that was not appropriate either. And then... She said it was a huge job. It lasted for months. Um, so the defense, again, is trying to prove that, again, their prior claim that Glenn Maxwell was too busy to vet girls for Epstein, too busy to have sex with minors, too busy to do any of this. However, we have pictures of her doing all of it. So, um, excuse me, not the actual pictures. We don't have that. But we have pictures of her on the island. We have pictures on her enjoying her life. So obviously, she wasn't too busy to do that, right? So just a lot of minutia, a lot of minutia, just trying to t tire us out. So then um, the defense asked uh, Kimberly about Annie Taylor. Do you know Annie Taylor? Yes, Annie Taylor was a personal assistant to Ghislaine, as opposed to her, Espinosa, who was Ghislaine's executive assistant. So Annie Taylor was Ghislaine's personal assistant, meaning she would fetch her coffee, she would fetch her lunch, she would, you know, do her personal stuff, but... Um, Espinosa was responsible for all the business uh, help that Ghislaine needed. So any of the assistants could, so then she said that any of the assistants could contact the pilots for times and places for flights. But right before she said that, she said that only Epstein was a char in charge of calling the pilots for wheels up, meaning what time they were going to leave at a certain airport. So like I'm sitting there like, didn't she just literally say the opposite thing, but nobody else said anything and nobody questioned it. But she said like two completely opposing things, one right in back of the other. First, that Epstein was the only one who called for, re for wheels up and then that any of the assistants did it. And I know I'm not crazy. So anyhow, um, she arranged commercial flights for Glenn Maxwell through an agency. I guess people did that back in the day, like when there was no internet, I, um, through a traveling agency in this. Now, you're in Manhattan, right? And Manhattan has the best of everything. And the place, that, the travel agency that she used was called Shoppers Travel. Shoppers, like a, like a shopper. Like, doesn't that sound super sketch? 
Because that sounds super sketch to me. Like, I would not go, I wouldn't use those services, would you? I mean, I would at least want, like, a full name. Like, not shoppers, but whatever. Um, so she also booked massages for Miss Maxwell and for Epstein. She stayed at Ghislaine's place in London. She said she didn't know who owned it. And then the defense asked leading questions about Epstein's charity. Um, and she said he was a giver. And she laughed about it. And I was like, vomit. Vomit. Like, you guys, like, try to understand. I mean, I, I know that you understand. But it's one thing for me to tell you this. It's a whole other thing. We're watching this. And I'm like, this can't be real. Like, this cannot be real. He was a giver. And, like, in that way that she was, like, <laughs> like, I don't know if she, I, again, I don't know if she's actually trying, if she's a hostile witness and this is how she does it. Or maybe she's too smart for me. Or maybe she's smarter than all of us and this is how she gets back. I don't know. I don't know. But to me, the whole thing was super weird. So, um, so did you ever get gifts from him or whatever? She's like, no, he didn't really give me gifts. Um, I got a watch when I left. And then the defense is like, well, did he ever invite you to any events that, you know, like he treated you to? And she was like, oh, yes. And then there was, again, the big smile. And again, super gross, right? Fine. So by 1040, I was like, is this over yet? Like, I can't. So finally, they asked her about Jane. So I'm like, okay, let's get to the point. She says that she recalls Jane in the office with her mother, she said, probably in the beginning to middle of my time there. She, and then they, the defense asked her, how old does she look? And she said, she looked 18. Full stop. How do you, when you are asked, right, how old is somebody? How old do they look? And then you, you're going to like round it around, right? You're going to say, oh, that was a kid, like probably 18, like 17. But you're not going to 18. Like what does 18 look like? Or if, I don't know, if she looked young, she's like, oh, maybe 18 to 22. Like most people would answer like that. Who says she looked 18? Like, that was the magic number. She couldn't have looked any other age except 18. What does 18 look like? Because 18 could be, like, 18 to 22. 18 could be, like, 16 to 22, right? That could still be 18, looking 18. But she hit it, like, straight on the head, which was such a, a tell, right? Because that's not how people answer that type of question. So she looked 18. Boom. Uh, how many times was she there? Maybe five times. I know Jane's mother called the office a lot because I talked to her a lot. And she would ask to speak to Epstein. So uh, Jane's mother said Jane was Jeffrey's goddaughter. This is a direct quote. So how did, uh, the question was by the defense, how did you treat Jane in the office? She said they considered Jane family to Epstein. She was just, every, we treat everyone special, but she was just a little extra special. Again, vomit like just gross the whole thing was super gross and uncalled for um did her brothers visit the office she says i don't recall uh and then about jane again she said i felt it was a loving relationship why did jane stop visiting the office and then she says i think she went to california to work on a soap opera she sent me a few single headshots and cast pictures all signed this is my favorite so Barbara. I'm such a big fan. Who cares? We don't need to know that. Like, that's not important. So definitely the, de um, the defense is establishing that Jane somehow was either okay with having sex with Epstein and Ghislaine or that it never happened. Like, I at that point, I was like, I know they're not going to go there because as she, regardless, minors cannot consent no matter what. So that dies right there. And I, they didn't go all the way there, but it seemed like that's where they were trying to go. So then they show her uh, the pictures, evidence that Jane sent Kim, and then she said, yes, that's them at um, Espinosa. She attested that Jane and her family stayed at the New York, um, Epstein's New York residence in the late 90s, early 2000s. In 1996, quote, I thought they were a couple, her and um, Epstein and Ghislaine. I thought they were a couple. They behaved like a couple. They kind of went their separate ways. Uh, Ghislaine started dating other men the last two years of my employment there. Um, so then she starts calling out like different women that were in the office as well. A woman named Selena Middle, what sounded like Middlefarge, uh, Gwendolyn Beck, Jane, etc. They would visit in his office and I wouldn't see that. So he would close the door or the girls would come in 
the women would come into the office, they'd wait in the waiting room, then an assistant would come and take them, and then they'd go into his office, and she said, and I, I wouldn't see that. So Epstein sent Selena flowers. Did you think they were dating? So there's a time that Epstein asked uh, Espinosa to send flowers to Selena, and the, def the defense says, did you think they were dating? And then she's kind of like, like laughing. She's like, I felt that, that they were a couple. They were together. They were a couple. Did Glenn Maxwell know about you buying flowers for Selena from Epstein? And she said she did not. So right there, I'm super confused. Like, when was this Selena thing? Because you just said that in the early, well, when you first got there for the first two years, it seemed like Glenn Maxwell and Epstein were a couple. And now you're saying that he was sending flowers to this other chick. And now you're saying that they were a couple. Can you give us times or dates? Or like, I'm super confused at this point. Um... So 2000 to 2002, she said that Ghislaine and Epstein's relationship was over. Uh, Ghislaine uh, continued employment and she maintained her position. And about Sarah Kellen, she said, I'm not sure what her job was, but she was always with Epstein. They were, um, she was asked about Ted Waite and she said, Ghislaine Maxwell's boyfriend, uh, I met him in 2008, 2009. Ghislaine Maxwell dated him. Uh, in 2001 or so, Glenn Maxwell referred uh, Espinosa to a few jobs. Um, so, whatever, like she helped her secure employment with like letters of recommendation and whatever. So the prosecution comes on finally, right? So the only question that they asked her was, did you ever go to Epstein's Florida home? And she said no, and that's it. Boom, to the point. Next witness is the shopper's guy, shopper's travel agency. Like who would even, that sounds so sketch. Anyhow, so that's the, the traveling agency that uh, Glenn Maxwell would use to schedule flights for herself if, you know, she wasn't on the private plane, whatever. So this guy's name was Raghu Sood. And I, I couldn't really understand him too much because he had a very heavy accent. Um, but he ba basically confirmed that Epstein was a customer and that he had... Uh, invoices for Epstein from 1999 to 2006 and then the uh, question was uh, so cross-examination was by Mo she said so you didn't book travel for Epstein's office be before 1999 and he said if we did we don't have an invoice for that boom so that tells you everything all right so then now witness number three Elizabeth Loftus here we go Sternheim is on the defense and she's uh, examining that she's asking her the questions this woman, Elizabeth Loftus, older white lady, she's a professor. She makes it a point for everyone to know that she's a professor. And so she was there to talk about memory and especially false memory, right? She is the, she's made an entire career, this woman, since like the 70s of being a consultant for defense attorneys in criminal um, cases mostly high profile cases. In all of her time, she's only helped the prosecution one time. Every other time it was for criminal defense and high profile, right? So this woman charges $600 an hour and she doesn't look back. She just, you know, she wrote a book. Like all, first 20 minutes was just her CV. We had to hear about every school that she, every school that she went to. We had to hear about every firm that she worked at, every journal, every peer reviewed, every um, honor, every, uh, I mean, anything that you can imagine in this woman's life, that's what we had to listen to for 20 minutes. To the point where I was like, what, is, where are we right now? And so like a lawyer friend there was like, oh, you know, they're just trying to establish that, her credibility. And I get that. They're trying to intimidate the jury with this woman who has like this very, um, extremely like it's just amazing uh cv right of everywhere that she studied i mean she studied in switzerland she did the, i mean it's, you name it she did it so however that does not mean that she know that she knows what she's talking about right because we all know how this works and pomerantz did such an amazing job when i did my my update my live update for lunch she hadn't been cross-examined yet and we were talking i was like i cannot wait for pomeranz to get over there and to rip her to shreds and that is exactly what she did and it was so nasty we were like standing up like clapping it was amazing to watch 
So anyhow, before all that happens, so Luftus says, well, I'm here to talk about memory, especially false memory. I'm a professor at UC, um, uh, UCLA Irvine Psychological Science and Crimin Criminality Department. She's very self-satisfied. She rattled off her entire resume. Like I said, it took 20 minutes. Um, and then they asked her, Professor, what is a CV? And then she had to ex explain what a CV was, and we had to sit there and listen to that. And then why was the defense asking her this? Because they were going to bring her CV. They printed it out for the jury. This is so tasteless. And so all the jury had to like, like look through all of the uh, accomplishments that this woman had in the hopes that they would believe her. That is how fragile her testimony was, that they had to like ab abut it with pages and pages of CV, like, oh, but she studied here, but she studied there. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but but look how many people have actually agreed that she's brilliant. So you must agree with it. It's just like, I don't think the jury fell for it. And I pray that they didn't. So anyhow, she attested that she and her group conducted experiments in which they implanted false memories into their target group, which produced 100% belief in so 100% of the people that, so that what they did, her and her, her, her scientist friends, is that they would take a group and they would start implanting memories into them and, and running experiments to see if it would take or not. And she said for those that actually were, um, that would accept these uh, suggestions, they would have 100% emotional reactions just as if it had. Um, and they truly believed it, right? So she now she goes on to say the stages of memory formation, she draws it on a, like a little board there, and she says the first stage is the acquisition stage when the event actually happens. The second stage is the retention stage, after some time has passed. And then number three, the retrieval stage is when is the playback when a person is asked to testify or to be interviewed or when they're asked about it. When they retrieve it, that's actually where the memory starts forming, which I, I've read, I'm not a doctor. But I've read different theories on this. Anyhow, like if a person goes through a trauma, the memory is immediate. The trauma is held inside the body. The, literally inside of the body is where the trauma goes. So immediately that's imprinted on the brain. And to say that that doesn't come up until you're asked about it, that's where the memory, I, I, I mean, whatever. That's, that's what she says. And let's continue. So she says there's also the internal source of retrieval, like auto-suggestion. Uh, deriving inferences that start to seem real and post-event suggestion, misinformation, supplementation. The older the memory, the higher the chance that it's been contaminated. Contaminated meaning that the person having the memory actually was open to suggestion and the memory was somehow changed because of the suggestion, whether internal or external. So then she said something very interesting that we already know. She said, the media is the source of post-event suggestion that we've studied. Yeah, no kidding me. Um, so the obvious flaw, so, okay, what I wrote here, the obvious flaw in this testimony is that if memory cannot be trusted, then Glenn Maxwell's accounts or the accounts of the defense's witnesses, like Espinosa, who's just there, lose all meaning, right? So basically just throw out Espinosa's uh, entire uh, testimony because you can't trust that that doesn't exist memories don't exist memories aren't real what you remember isn't real um, and, and she just kept pounding this in so if Jane's memory can't be trusted then neither can Espinosa's or neither can Glenn Maxwell's or neither can the pilots so where are we going with this so she says so then she said something so stupid that I was like she said people are a little more accurate when they're confident but even false memories can be retold with a high degree of confidence. So basically, who doesn't who doesn't know that? I mean, so then what she's basically saying is that just because a person knows that they what they went through, that doesn't mean that that's actually what they went through. So nothing is really real unless that you can prove it. And if you can't prove it, then it's not real if it's just a memory. And this is the this is like the gaslighting. And all I kept thinking was, oh my God, like if I'm an adult sitting here and I want to scream, I can imagine a child, imagine if a little kid says that they're being abused, however, which way by an adult and they get into the hands of a psychologist like this. Can you imagine? I mean, to a child, this is crazy making to me, but a child will believe it. A child will start to question, like, did it happen like that? Maybe it didn't happen like that. Maybe I, I saw it on TV. Maybe 
you know, like, and, and they go down this whole path. This is so horrific. And I was just like, wow, this is why there's so many people walking around right now that cannot get it together and don't even know where they're standing. They don't even know what the truth is. They don't know what anything is. It's because of this, stuff like this. And trust me, you don't know anybody's life. You think they got their stuff together or you think they're so happy and go lucky? When you come to find out where a lot of people come from, you'll be shocked. So this is, I saw that and I was like, this is why we're so messed up. Um, so yeah, I put it there. I, the level of gaslighting is profound. Is this what they do to kids when they bring up allegations of abuse? This is nuts. And then we had a lunch break. During my lunch break, I found out that Luft's, um, Luftus' studies have actually been deemed inadmissible. And I forgot if it was either the, the state board or the, or the federal board. It's one or the other, but whichever one it is, it still isn't enough to keep her off of a witness stand. So that's why she's able to like be a consultant or like be a um, a, a witness and testify right on on her knowledge. Um, and I wrote here. I hope Pomerantz brings this up in cross. This woman has no conscience. Fine. At two twenty nine, the jury comes back. It's Luftus. It's Sternheim. Uh, now the defense is asking Luftus questions, and so the defense is asking Luftus, and Luftus is answering, looking at the jury. She's answering like this. She's like, and that's why, you know, like when I did, and I'm like, you're supposed to address the defense. That's who's asking you the question. But she completely, and the judge was just like, like this the whole time because it was super annoying. And I don't think that she, the judge really could like bear it anymore. So she wasn't paying attention. But to look at the jury, like the whole time as you're answering the question, I was like, okay, that's new. I haven't seen that. So... And she looks over at them, she's smiling, she's very like um, animated with them, and she says, confidence is malleable. Okay, like who doesn't know that? And Sternheim attempts to bring Luftus' entire CV to the jury again. There was an objection, it was overruled. So she said that she makes $600 an hour for her time. Sternheim asked her to disclose that post-event information um, she asked her about that. She's like, uh, the media can be intentional or inadvertently uh, effective. Yes, correct. So secondary, uh, secondary, I don't know what I wrote here. I don't know, I wrote something. Uh, can, or motive create false memories, right? Oh, can secondary gain or motive create false memories? In other words, if you are getting paid, like say for example, that's what they're trying to say. Like these women were about to get paid from the fund and so can that affect how their memories, and you know, just ask the question straight out. We're all adults here, but no, she wants to go around the bush, so fine. So pr the professor says, well, people seem to accept suggestion more readily if people are offered money for their memory. It certainly seems plausible. And I was like, okay whatever the source of the post event people are more likely to accept it when it comes from somebody they trust young children are more likely to accept it from adults than from other young children um, how would you know that because you run experiments on kids that's great um post event contamination that's when the suggestion is actually accepted i said that now comes the cross pomerantz was on fire it was like pomerantz and comey both have a style which is like rapid fire when they are when they are um, very active and very like uh, sure of what they're about to do, they start like the questions very like politely, um, you know, but like super fast, like one after the other, like one after the other. The witness gets to answer, of course. They don't like talk over the witness, but it's like relentless. That's the word, relentless. So Pomeranz comes up and she said, you testified that you are also a consultant, correct? Yes. You consult with attorneys in defense cases hundreds of times, correct? Correct. And with, and with the defense, you've consulted dozens of times, correct? She says, correct. 150, you've consulted, no, I'm sorry, you've testified in 150 criminal trials, all for the defense, only one time for prosecution, correct? Uh, so is it fair to say that you've made a career out of testifying for criminal defense, correct? And then she hit the nerve and she said, you've written a book. It's called Witness for the Defense, correct? Not Impartial Witness, correct? And we were like, 
whoa. And it's the tone that she said it in. Like she, she just killed her right there. And you could feel the blood draining from this woman's face. And so then they presented a uh, GX 1500, which is Loftus's book, Witness for the Defense. And then um, Pomeran says, okay, uh, there was a question in the book. And did you write the question of should psychologists in a court of law be an educator or an impartial witness? My answer to that question, if I'm completely honest, is both. Did you write that? So here's this woman. And Pomeranz was killing her. And now she can't even, now she can't find the quote. She's like, oh, I, I don't know, you know, what what um, page you're on. And Pomeranz was like, okay, well, you don't need the, I mean, it's in the book. It's also in front of you on the screen. But also, I'm just asking you straight out, like, did you write that? She's like, well, I can't you know, find it. And, and like, finally she found it. And she said, uh, yeah, she said, you don't sit in the courtroom. Pomeranz asked her, but you don't sit in the courtroom when you're testifying, correct? You weren't, for example, you weren't present in the courtroom for this trial, correct? And she said, no, not in the courtroom. So you're charging the defense $600 an hour, correct? And consulted in hundreds and hundreds of cases, correct? You served as a paid witness for high profile clients, correct? And Loftus is like, correct. But she's sinking, like you can hear in her voice. She's like stammering, she's, she's like, wasn't expecting this. So Parman says, since 1975, you've testified in high profile cases, you've gotten media attention, and that's raised your public profile, correct? And uh, Loftus was like, well, I, I wouldn't put it that way. She was stammering the whole time. Um, well, your testimonies, your testimonies have helped you get hired by other defense lawyers, correct? And she got super defensive. She said, I don't market myself at all. She said, no, but you provide defense attorneys with the names of cases you've testified, correct? And she stammers again. She's like, only when asked, uh, but you testified for Harvey Weinstein, correct? And that was like, like, okay, finally, she found a way I love Pomerantz. Comey's whole team is just incredible. But anyway, Pomerantz and Comey are like two of the best attorneys I've ever seen. Like, for sure. So, and it's not just like what she said. I'm telling you, it is the tone. Like, she murdered her with that. So, she said, you, uh, okay, so you testified for Harvey Weinstein, correct? And everybody goes crazy. The judge calls for a sidebar immediately. Immediately. So, when they come back, apparently Pomerantz won that because... They come back and, and nothing's really, so Pomeranz continues, you participated in interviews uh, with the press about your testimony in high profile cases, correct? In your book, you provide chapters named after the high profile cases that you testified in, correct? And she's like hammering away, hammering away. And now was the third death blow. You're not a psychologist, correct? You've never treated a single patient, correct? You do not treat victims of traumatic events. Correct? And she just, look, love just became like a statue. And she said, I've never treated anyone like that. And I was like, oh my God, like this is so good. Like I wish I could watch it on repeat. So, but she didn't stop. Pomeranz kept on. You've conducted many experiments, correct? Your conclusions are all based on experiments, correct? You had an experiment called the Bugs Bunny experiment which involved an advertisement of Buzz, Bugs Bunny in Disneyland. It was used um, like a, a fake photograph, correct? And it was used to ask people if they remembered meeting Bugs Bunny in Disneyland, correct? And 16% of them said they recalled that, correct? 16%. And Loftus is like stammering. She's like, I, I don't remember the percentage. No problem. Pomerantz has it. She's like, um, Your Honor, can we please bring up GX 1511? You know we can. You know we can. So they have sidebar number two because now the defense is like bricks, right? Now they're like, what is happening? She's coming. Like, why is she hitting her this hard? Like, Pomerantz was not giving up. Like, it was three death blows. Bam, bam, bam. Like, at all, she wasn't giving up. So they come back. Pomerantz won that again, obviously, because now she comes back. She's like, okay. Um... So I put here, Pomeranz clearly won that sidebar again. God bless this judge. So directed to Luft, uh, so she directs Luftus to the 16% quote out of her own book. So she says, so 16% went along with it, correct? 
And Leptis stammers. She's like, well, pull it back up. She says, the thing that the subjects got wrong is that they saw Bugs Bunny at Disneyland, correct? But not that they saw Bugs Bunny or not. Meaning they still remembered the memory. They, the only thing they got wrong was the place. But it doesn't mean that they made up the whole thing about Bugs Bunny. It was just that what, what part they were susceptible to is where they saw him. And it was only 16% of them. It wasn't even 25% of the people. It was 16%. Not enough to make all of these conclusions and base an entire career charging $600 an hour to let criminals off the hook right? And anybody should pay attention to you when you've never even treated a person, you've never even treated a trauma victim, you have no idea how memory works in trauma victims because you've never treated them. You said so yourself. These are all experiments that you've conducted in a laboratory, which is not the same thing. So she, I mean, she totally killed this woman's reputation or um, what do you, like whatever they they were trying to make her like seem valid. Pomeranz destroy that, like destroy that. So then she continues, you testified about an experiment involving a, a simulated car crash, correct? The signage was the point of contention, correct? Whether it was a yield or a stop sign. But the participants still remembered the crash, correct? Were any of your subjects threatened with imprisonment? And then um, whatever, the professor was like, well, yes, correct. It, you know, that, that was the point, like they didn't get the colors right. But they still remembered the crash, and that's the point, right? So were any of your subjects threatened with imprisonment if they lied to you? So of course it was an objection and whatever else happened, fine. And then another experiment about the color of the car, the color of the jacket, all these details were changed, correct? Lost in the mall experiment. False memory that subjects were told that either their parent or their older sibling attested to that they actually had had um, been lost in the mall, being little. And even though these subjects say, well, I don't remember that, if they were told that their parent or their older sibling said, yeah, absolutely happened, then even then, only 25% partially remembered, partially remembered that fake memory out of this woman's book, correct? And 75% were not subject to this, correct? And then she goes, yeah, that's right. And it was so good. It was so good. Okay. So another thing uh, in the book, if something contradicts the truth so blatantly, then a subject isn't susceptible to the suggestion. Correct? She says, yes. Not happily. She says, yes. Post-event contamination. Children under the age of six are the most susceptible. Correct? Again, unhappily, she says, correct. Not all memories are retained equally. Correct? Again, she says, correct. Like through the, through gritted teeth. Uh, so then she says, the core memory of trauma, this is Palmer is talking, the prosecutor, the core memory of trauma are mostly remembered, correct? Even if the details change, correct? And then, so Loftus is there, and she's like, I probably agree with that. Oh, gosh, she just killed her so good. If you, so what she said, uh, if you, if you participate, it's, better than if you're just observing. So I guess she just threw that in there because of whatever happened to um, Carolyn, but it, at this point it didn't matter. Like her credibility was shot. Um, so Pomerantz was like, okay, but when the more you have, like if there's higher frequency, the better the memory, correct? Again, through gr gritted teeth, yes. You've never done a study where teenage girls are sexually abused, correct? Or attempted to implant a memory of sexual abuse, correct? And Loftus was like, we have not. So the redress, this was the only thing the defense could come up with. You have received numerous awards for the work you've done, correct? Objection, sustained. You're restricted by the types of experiments you're allowed to conduct, correct? Objection, overruled. Loftus stammered through her explanation, none of which mattered. Pomerantz made it crystal clear that Luptus has zero expertise on trauma or memory of trauma victims. Uh, she continues, you've consulted for the CIA, IRS, FBI, blah, blah, blah. Objection sustained. Objection from the prosecution. This judge is great. This judge is incredible. Uh, if the prosecution had called you, you would have been a witness for them too, correct? And she said, I might have been. And that was, that said it all. Like that literally said it all. Like this was such an amazing cross examination. Like this, I think was the strongest 
And I think that the defense was looking forward to this. They probably thought this was going to be like their big opener and that the jury was just going to be like, ooh, like, oh man, all of this has just been a lie because memories are all a lie. And Pomerantz got up there and just killed her. Pomerantz is a very small person, by the way, I have to add. And so as a small person, I appreciate that. Uh, the fourth witness was Michael William Asmaran, uh, and he was um, like, uh, what do you call it? I don't know the word. Like, the questions were asked by Everdale in the defense. U.S. Customs and Border Patrol uh, agent, like, whatever. And he's talking about just like how the manifests are recorded. And then it's just, he was asked to look up Jane with her real name, Kate with her real name, and Annie Farmer were the three persons that he was asked to look for from January 1st, 1994 through December 31st, 2010, which doesn't make sense. Why through 2010? Like Jane wasn't in the picture anymore. Neither was Carolyn and, and like whatever. Carolyn was even, they weren't even asking about her. But regardless, there was a sidebar, then a break. We came back at 4.15 and he was still going through like every single minutia point about the documents and how they're recorded. And I was like, you know what? Nothing's gonna happen. I already know how the defense works. The defense is going to wait it out. They're gonna stretch this out to the last minute. And even if the the prosecution gets to cross today, there's no point because regardless, like his testimony, what is he gonna testify to? Because unless, this is what I wrote, waste of time unless it's to prove that Kate was of age when she traveled. That's it, that would be the only point. And if that's the point, then make it. Um, I wrote here, I don't think either Jane or Annie Farmer said that they flew internationally with Gilead Maxwell or Epstein, so this is all pointless. The defense is trying to run the time out, as per usual, asking about different columns, what's in this column, what's this information, what does it, I mean, it was so like, it was like watching bread bake. It was like, and, and at this point, we already know how the defense does it. And it's all about wasting time, so I just didn't see the point. So I left at like 4.35. At that point, nothing else was going to be done. So that's what happened day 11 in the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. It was a complete win for the prosecution. The attorney on the prosecution team, Pomerantz, did a fantastic job um, of just tearing down the defenses. One of the defense's star witnesses that they were so happy and proud that she had all these accolades and that she had all this like impressive CV and in like five minutes Pomeranz just destroyed that woman like that woman was a, a, a smoking heap of you know what like within five minutes so congratulations to the team they did great once again like I've told you guys in the past if you have any reservations about Comey and her team don't they are so on it and I can't see a world, like I said, at this point where this woman doesn't go, doesn't get sentenced for these crimes. I see it clear as day. I could be wrong, but I don't see how, unless something happens from here to the end of the trial. So just stop by to this, drop a like, thank you. Okay, so it's, thank you, Max Love. You know what, you guys, like I said before, I'm gonna probably, um, Put a video up just to explain why I'm not doing these anymore for people who didn't like tune into this or whatever. Um, why would you? Lindsay wants to know, Nadia, why would you claim to be doing this to get the truth out when you clearly were only interested in making money, not here for the right reasons? Seems like someone's money hungry who pretends to help. Okay, Lindsay Dandrea, let me let me uh, address you specifically, Lindsay, since you asked me that question. I'm not here to make money, but I need to make enough money to continue doing the work, right? In the United States of America, when a person produces something, they are paid for their labor. They are paid for their product. If a producer is producing something and there's no one there to buy it, then what's the point of producing it, right? I need, I can't be at the courthouse for 40 hours a week, that's a full-time job, and produce these videos for three hours total because I do two live streams plus an hour to get everything together. That's three hours, so that's another 15 hours a week. So that's a total of 55 hours a week, Lindsay D'Andrea, and you're asking me to work 55 hours a week for free? 
I'm not doing it for the money, but how would you like me to pay my rent? How would you like me to pay for the internet that I need to make these videos? How would you like me to get that done? You see, the truth of the matter is that a lot of people said that this was something important to them. They said that this trial mattered. A lot of people said that they were tired of a mainstream media who wouldn't even tell them the truth about matters even or even cover something like this trial, which is so important. So I volunteered, Lindsay D'Andrea. I volunteered because I live here, because I thought it mattered, because I thought that you guys wouldn't mind paying 17 cents a day, not to make me rich, but to support me so that I can afford to go do this, Lindsay D'Andrea. Do you, do you understand that? That there's a difference between getting rich and famous off of this work and just being able to do the work? Who do you think pays for my transportation to and from the courthouse? I do. Who pays for my lunch? I do. This is all me. Those 40 hours a week that I'm not, that I'm at the courthouse, I'm not making money. Do you see that, Lindsay D'Andrea? Do you understand why I'm asking for the support of the people that I serve? Because if the people that I serve don't find any value in what I'm doing, then that's cool. I'm not angry, but I'm just going to stop doing it because there's no point. There's no point for me to produce anything on a market if there's no customers, right? Would you, Lindsay D'Andrea, go to work for free? Would you? Would you? Would you go to work for free? Why, and if not, why not? Why not, Lindsay D'Andrea? Why wouldn't you work for free? Because you're money hungry? Because you're a gold digger? or because you depend on that money to support yourself so you can keep working and producing. Are you getting rich off of just getting your, your enough money to work, to pay your bills and keep a roof over your head? Is that, is that you being a, a gold digger? I mean, the question here is, who's the real gold digger? I don't want anything for free. I'm working for mine. But Lindsay D'Andrea, it sounds like you want my labor for free. Why is that? Why do you think that you're entitled to my work for free? Why? Is what I'm doing not worth 17 cents a day? Because I guarantee you that you guys are spending a lot more than $4.99 a month on different things. And that's fine because those things are the things that you prioritize in your life. And that's cool. But don't tell me that I am charging or, or me charging anybody for anything, for membership, from the people that I serve. All I'm asking for is five bucks a month. Not so I can become rich, but so that I can do this work. I can't afford to do this. Otherwise, I'm not married, I'm not married, period. I don't have a wealthy husband. I don't have a patron. My father was not a rich man. He didn't die and leave me millions. No, none of that is true, Lindsay D'Andrea. So I hope, Lindsay D'Andrea, that you now understand why in the United States of America, people who produce work expect to get paid and supported by their customers. And if their customers stop supporting them, then they stop producing. Too easy. It's it's the free market, Lindsay D'Andrea. So in case you've never heard of the free, thank you all for your super chats, I appreciate you. In case you have never heard of the free market, Lindsay D'Andrea, look it up. Look up Adam Smith and see how that all works. And that's exactly how this is working because I don't have enough support, unfortunately, to continue doing this. So Lindsay D'Andrea, don't tell me that this is important to you. Don't pretend, because it's obviously not. If 17 cents a day is too much money to pay for this, this is obviously not important to you. It's not, it's not. And that's fine, so I'll stop doing it. That's it. But I just wanna clarify for you guys. Like I told you at the beginning, these videos are not monetized. Why? Because of the content, because it's about Blaine Maxwell. No monetization, I get no ad revenue. On top of that, YouTube has been shadow banning me since July 31st, 2021. I have the physical proof, I have the analytical proof. I have sent out various emails to YouTube. I've asked you guys even, have they unsubscribed you? Have they done this? Have they done that? Because this is how they are messing with my channel. But have they helped me? No, they haven't helped me because that's how YouTube works. And we all know that. So I thought to myself, you know what? I can get around this. I can put up a, a super thanks button like everybody else has. So the people who watch a video and they like it, they can drop a dollar, they can drop two bucks, whatever it is. And that's extra revenue. And that's how I'm going to get over this hump of censorship, right? But guess what? YouTube doesn't allow me access to that super thanks button. So I don't have it. And people keep telling me, oh, you know, you should just put up a donation. I don't have access to that. 
I do not have, why, don't, why not ask me first? I don't have access to that button. So the only revenue that I'm getting for this work is straight from my super chats, whatever you guys want to give me, and I thank you so much, or from memberships, which are $4.99, Lindsay D'Andrea. And that's why, Lindsay D'Andrea, I can't keep doing this because I cannot afford, I, there's no other revenue stream, Lindsay D'Andrea, and I'm sorry that you feel, you know, that I should work for you for free. I'm sorry that you feel that I should go live under a bridge because I can't pay my rent. I'm sorry that you feel like that, but I'm not gonna live under a bridge so that you can get free content because you feel entitled to it. It's not gonna happen. This is America. If it matters, you'd pay for it. If you didn't, it doesn't matter. So I'll stop doing it. But anyways, I've taken too much time on Lindsay D'Andrea and all the Lindsay D'Andreas out there who don't understand how the United States works. You want things for free, go to China. I'm sure there are free things over there. Um, I love you guys. Uh, like I said before, I'm sorry that I'm not able to, to continue this. I'm really exhausted and, you know, I'm probably going to go to the trial, but like after the trial, I just need to have a life and have a way to like keep my life afloat. So, um, and we'll see, we'll see. I'll, I'll make videos, of course, like I did before, but it will be videos that don't necessitate me being like 40 hours a week in one place without money, without getting paid. You know, I'll make videos, I'll, you know, do what I used to do, research current events and write on them just like I did before. You guys enjoyed those videos before and I hope you stay with me. And hopefully uh, once we get to 100K, which should be anytime soon, I mean, we're like not even 4,000 uh, subscriptions away from that. As soon as I get to 100K, then we can apply for a sponsorship and then you guys won't have to worry about it. I'll have a sponsor to take care of that and you guys can get everything for a quote unquote free because somebody else will be paying for my time. Um, but until then, I love you guys. Um, I have a, a, other ideas I'm gonna put out there so hopefully you guys will support me in that and I'll still do the political uh, stuff as well because you know, that's where my heart is. And, um, but yeah, I gotta mix it up a little bit because getting demonetized on YouTube is no joke. Uh, especially if there's no other form of support. But I love you guys so much. Thank you for everything. God bless you all. And I will talk to you guys soon.